You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are continuing our conversation in the Set Apart to Serve series right here on The Coffee Hour. We'll continue that conversation in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today is Tom Reggie, Principal of Zion Lutheran Church and School in Georgetown, Texas. Principal Reggie, welcome to The Coffee Hour. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and hopefully everything is well there in St. Louis. Well, we are, we're interested in in learning your story about becoming a church worker, particularly serving as an educator and a principal. You have, I think, kind of a unique background, a unique path to becoming a Lutheran educator. Let's talk about what you were doing before you went to Concordia University, Nebraska to become a Lutheran educator. I'd be happy to. I'll start way back in North Tonawanda, New York, which is where I grew up. And I attended St. Mark's Lutheran School, K-8. to Wonderful experience. A uh, little background, my mom was a Lutheran teacher and my dad was a public school teacher. And all of my mom's brothers and sisters, and there were eight brothers and sisters all together, all became Lutheran teachers or principals. So I don't know if that's a record or not, but it's something I like to share because it's just an amazing statistic in our Lutheran system. Um, when I was graduating from high school, I already knew that I wanted to join the military. And the reason is because when I was a little guy, every Sunday, we would walk over to Grandma and Grandpa's house, which was a block away, and we would just enjoy time with my grandmother and grandfather. The interesting thing about this story, though, is that, you know, we'd have niceties when we arrived and drinks would be served and all that. But Grandpa and I would always retire to the kitchen table. Grandma had this routine. She would bring this pin of chocolate chip cookies. She would place it on the kitchen table. She'd open the canister and she would make Grandpa and me a cup of Taster's Choice coffee. And at this time, I was about 16 years old, and Grandpa started to open up about his time in World War I, so he served in the Army. And the stories he shared with me, I was spellbound. Some of them were difficult to tell, but I'm the only one that he ever told those stories to. My dad served in the Korean conflict in the Army also, and so before I graduated, I knew I wanted to serve my country also, just like dad and grandpa did. So I went into the Air Force. They were both a little disappointed that I didn't go into the Army like they did, but it, I just had an opportunity there. Where I served, so several places, Rapid City, South Dakota at Ellsworth Air Force Base, Clark Air Base in the Philippines, Kunsan Air Base in Korea, wherever I was stationed, I thought, do I want to keep doing this or do I want to do something else? And teaching always came back to an answer in my prayers. And so I decided to go to school at night, wherever I was stationed. And by the time I was finished with my four years, I had gotten a year in and Concordia, Nebraska accepted that year. So I came in as a transfer student to Seward. But I would just say that All those years serving in the Air Force, I had what I call a Holy Spirit tug often that, Lord, do you want me to keep doing what I'm doing here or do you want me to go into the classroom? And it always came back to going into a classroom. And so I just followed his lead. How did your military experience help you throughout your education at Nebraska and then getting into the classroom finally? I mean, teaching's obviously in your blood, so there's a lot of that a lot of that learning going on. But how did that military background and hearing the stories from your grandpa, how did that serve you as you went through your education and into the classroom? Well, I, I firmly believe that the Lord prepares us for what's up ahead. And so I think that's a very perfect question, Sarah, that it was leadership for sure. When I was in basic training in San Antonio, the TI, technical instructor, the guy who always gets in your face and yells at you and stand up straight and make your bed and all that. One day he said, Airman Reggie, 
please come to my office in 30 minutes. And I walked into his office, stood at attention. He said, please sit down. He said, I want you to be one of four squad leaders for this whole time at basic training. And I was probably the most shy person there could be, uh, very much an introvert. And you can't say no to a TI. I mean, you have to say, yes, sir, right? So I did, not knowing what I was getting myself into, but I learned to love being a leader at that point for the first time in my life. And then when I got to the rank of staff sergeant, I was able to lead many different groups and people. And when I got to Concordia University, I immediately looked for opportunities to do that too. So, and I'm a principal today, you know, I was a teacher for many years too. So I think all those small opportunities turned into larger ones in the bigger picture. And it has served me well in, in a very humble way, but it has given me confidence. I'd say that's probably the main thing to serve the Lord. Hmm. I'm just thinking, are there other skills that were, uh, that you gained in the military that would be useful in the classroom today? I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe not taking the same approach as the TI. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not. I, I think there's something to that question, Andy. I think it is, there's something called presence. And mm. I really don't know how to explain that real well, other than, you know, to walk into a classroom and there's a sense of respect. And I think that you can command respect, but really it's based on relationships. And so I had to work with many, many, many people, both in the Air Force and also when I was at Concordia, Nebraska. And I think it just helped to season me to understand my great love for Jesus through the children and staff members I serve, but also for them to realize that, you know, you can engage in a powerful way in the classroom with your teacher, your instructor, with your principal. But there's a presence there that says that we care for each other and we all love Jesus. And so I think that's kind of a, an interesting way to answer your question. It's the truth. Where did you go from, so, so you went from military to transferring uh, in as a transfer student at Concordia University, Nebraska, uh, through your teacher education and formation at Concordia, Nebraska. Where did you go from there? Tell us a little bit about that journey as an educator to becoming a principal today at Zion in Georgetown, Texas. Absolutely. Well, I student taught at Trinity Lutheran School, Atchison, Kansas. It was a fifth, sixth grade combination, and I still remember my principal well, who's now in heaven, Mark Mullenbrook. And he basically said to me a week after I was there, he said, you've got this, Tom. By the way, we have an opening next school year. If you might be interested, I would hire you on the spot. And he said the same thing. He said, and when you walked in here, there was just a sense of respect for you and what you do. And you always humbly share your faith. You know what the Great Commission is. And then from there, I was a teacher in Levittown, Pennsylvania. And my uncle, Uncle Wilmer Kuski, was my principal. So that would be my mom's brother. So full circle, right? And from there, I went to Columbus, Indiana. And that was St. Peter's Lutheran Church and School. And the principal there, David Florine, he said, Tom, I'm going to send you to SLED. What's SLED? It's School Leadership Development. Haven't you heard of it? It's, it's the latest and the greatest. And you'd go to Synod and you'd have training and leadership. I think you'd be a great leader. And so that was SLED 1 that I went to. And it was in the late 1990s. And within a week, I knew that I wanted to change over from being a teacher to being a principal. And when I came back from SLED, I said, David, I want to become a principal. He said, well, I'm not going to retire or leave, so you're going to probably have to take a call. So at that point, I went to Trinity, Evansville, Darmstadt, Indiana, and then up to Trinity, Jackson, Michigan. And the reason I went from Trinity, Evansville to Jackson, Michigan is I wanted to be a full-time principal, not a part-time principal. And then I went to my largest school, Trinity in Utica, which was right at about 500 students. And then kind of to wrap that up where I am now in Texas, have been here for 10 years, the 
district executor, Dr. Bill Hens, he called me one day and he said, I have this school I want you to think about. It's out in the country. It's high tech, which you love. There's a lot, there's special needs kids there, which I know you have a passion for. And the culture is just incredible. And he was right. And so that's where I've been since then. And it's just been a great place to serve. We are continuing our conversation in the Set Apart to Serve series. Today, our guest is... Excuse me. Today, our guest is Tom Reggie, principal of Zion Lutheran Church and School in Georgetown, Texas. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Goldseth. We're talking with Tom Reggie, principal at Zion Lutheran Church and School in Georgetown, Texas. And you were telling your story before we went to break of where you've gone throughout Synod as a teacher and a principal and your your um, journey into leadership in a school. I want to talk a little bit more about the importance of good leadership in in the formation of kids. What is what What role does good leadership play and in the formation of the kids that that you're in charge of i don't think we can ever take things for granted we have to teach them we have to consider attention to detail one of the things i like to do is i created this kind of fun little system at my school it's called the answer bench and what i did is i placed a bench outside my office and it has the words the answer bench on it And I sit out there numerous times a day and children know that if they have questions they want to ask me or if they desire answers about something or if they have an idea, we sit down together and they probably don't know it as much as I do, but it's a bonding time for them and for me. We've talked about baptism. We've talked about, hey, you'd become a great teacher. Have you ever thought about that in one of our Lutheran schools? And then it kind of spread in a unique way. And now I have teachers who sit down on my answer bench and I have parents who sit down on my answer bench and it's just become a bit of a story. But I think it just goes back to forming that bond with a child when they know and realize that the conversation is surrounded by the fact that I love Jesus and My goal is that they love Jesus too, but we have unchurched kids at our school too, and we have some who don't know the Bible at all or who go to church infrequently. So to me, it is just a time when we can create faith formation, no matter how old or how young, and that bond just seems to last forever and ever. I still have kids who come back who have graduated from here and even who have graduated from high school. Mr. Reggie, I remember that time we sat on the answer bench and you told me that story and you were able to listen to my story. And they're just unique moments that that help us to, I think, form a culture here that is really embraced. How do those relationships and that that culture of openness and willing to, to talk and answer questions, how does that play a role in the formation of the the encouragement and formation of future church workers, students at your school? I think if we, if we don't have the relational aspect, things won't move further into becoming as connected as we want them to be. When we form the relationships, the kids seem to be more engaged. And I also sprinkle humor. I don't know if that's part of your questioner, but I love to sprinkle humor into our conversations. And just a a short aside, every Friday morning on announcements, I do what are called Finally Friday Funnies. And 
I share really corny jokes over the intercom. And then <laughs> all during the day, Mr. Reggie, that was a really bad one. Or Mr. Reggie, could I share that at home with my mom and dad over supper tonight? That was a really fun joke that you shared. So I think it's just that. And then being in the life of the school, going out to recess and just sitting it down on a bench or climbing up the hill we have here together and sitting there when there are struggles with family issues, death that occurs, there's a pet that is no longer well, brother and sister issues. May I be baptized, Mr. Reggie? What is the, what is the thing that we do to become baptized here at Zion? I mean, those conversations just help me to know that God is in charge through his Holy Spirit. And so it's a whole series of things. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I think the goal is to be in the life of the school, to really be bold about talking about opportunities like being baptized. I often say, I'll see you in worship this weekend. And we open our Bibles often and we pray together all the time. So those things all seem to come together to provide a culture where Jesus Christ is central in all things. I know when we've talked with other people in this Set Apart to Serve series, talking about their journeys into church work, teachers frequently come up as people who have encouraged young people to consider something because, I mean, you're with the kids for so many hours during the day and you see their their talents and what they're good at. So having great role models who love Jesus and, and talk about the faith in school is so critical. And it's, it's really amazing to hear what you're able to do uh, at Zion. What are some roadblocks for youth and adults who are considering full-time church work? And what are some things that maybe you've worked through as to, to get through those roadblocks? Well, I think for those of us who are church worker families, I think we oftentimes bring things home. And I, say, I think we have to be careful about what we share because there are great challenges in ministry we always have to take the high road, but also be sincere and know that, you know, some things we would share with spouses, some things we share with kids. But I think we have to be careful because if we bring negativity home all the time, that can be something that would prevent a child from what to going into the ministry. I think also students are very adept in today's generation, especially those who are in college age right now and probably in high school that they look at how much it costs to attend one of our Concordias. And back in the day, I've talked to several people in my generation about this. We didn't really think twice about it. We knew that we would pay whatever it took. Maybe parents would help. We would have to go into debt, but it was just part of getting a degree that would allow us to teach effectively or lead effectively. So I think one of the problems there is, I don't know if we have a full answer to the debt crisis that some students would go into. And I think that's something set apart to serve is really trying to look at carefully. I hope that our Concordias are too collaboratively. Sometimes it's distance. You know, we have, we have several Concordias across the country and sometimes it's distance. And sometimes it's pressure from families too. No, you're going to stay at, and go to a state school. And so those are just some of the things that come to mind when you ask me that. Have you had the privilege of seeing some of your students pursue the education and formation to become a Lutheran teacher or other church worker? Many. <laughs> that is probably one of the greatest blessings that I can recount. And to a person, they typically come back and they say, it was my time spent in your Lutheran school that allowed me to see how Jesus worked in so many different ways through so many teachers, through so many opportunities. And because of that, I knew I wanted to become a teacher. So I've never really counted up how many of my former students, whether when I was a teacher or as an administrator, but there are many, many who have entered the field and just the other day, little, little Vidya, who is a second grader, she gets out of her car and she raises her arm like this. And she says, Mr. Reggie, guess what? 
I want to become a Lutheran teacher, second grade. <laughs> and then when I was teaching confirmation three weeks ago, I put a Bible verse on the whiteboard and I said, okay, students, I want you to come up here and share with me what you believe this verse means to you. And Annabelle went up to uh, the whiteboard and I just watched her in action. I saw what she wrote and it was, Annabelle, that is amazing. Have you ever thought about becoming a Lutheran teacher? She looked back at me, the biggest smile, and she said, I am going to become a Lutheran teacher. So the planting of the seeds, sometimes we don't even realize, but I think it's when we say the words, we encourage, we pray for these kids, and then we see it come to fruition in many different ways. So I guess you've given me a challenge, Andy, to just count up how many kids are now in, in church work from time that I spent with them in our Lutheran schools. <laughs> Tell us about your uh, role with LEA. Is that that is the, the Lutheran Educators Association? Is that right? Close Lutheran Education Association, LEA. Yep. I went to a convocation, I think in 1988 in St. Louis. That was the first one. It may not have been St. Louis, but that's just what I recall. And there were, you know, 5,000 Lutheran educators there. And I thought, this is a big thing. And it was fun. And then I had the opportunity to start writing for them. So I write blogs. I've also had a chance to write in their peer-reviewed journal, Shaping the Future. I presented probably over 25, 30 times different topics and I was asked by the executive director, Dr. John Lobbs, to consider becoming a board member. And I just jumped at the chance. So I've been serving on the board now for a couple of years. What I see is there are so many resources that are created. There are incredible connections that we have. It's an RSO that really, really seeks to make a difference as far as application and meaningful resources, and then bring us together for great conferences, probably some of the best I've ever been in, and great connection time with fellow uh, Lutheran educators. And those who aren't Lutheran, because we have lots of those in our schools too, usually it prompts conversations like, wow, I didn't realize that this was available, and thank you for allowing us to go to the conference. And of course, there's just new things that are happening all the time too. So it's been something I've embraced and, and I hope that we continue to assist our Concordias, church workers, the church at large, everyone as we point towards Christ. With just about two minutes left, in addition to Lutheran teachers, do you see a need for Lutheran principles as well today? Yes. If you look at the statistics, and I don't have that memorized, but the percentage of need for principles is so high, it's uh, a red flag that has been going up for some time. So I am concerned about that. And I know that, you know, we have the SLED program, which I've been a mentor in SLED also, not just a student, but it's just a great opportunity. Do you want me to go on and share other aspects of what could bring in more principles? Certainly. Okay. I believe that as, as we look at our staffs, if we're school leaders, that we need to start to look for those who probably would serve well as administrators, give them some responsibilities, watch them, listen to them, see if they indeed have that skill set. We can actually teach aspects of what the position of principalship is like, like inviting people into meetings or other events. There's other groups called ascending leaders, which could help prospective principles to understand if that is a right fit or not. But I think most importantly is just to talk through the position like with a Q&A and say, well, here are the parts that are just overwhelmingly incredible. Here are some real life challenges, but here's really what we do to serve the Lord and the position of principle. Our guest today, Tom Reggie, principal of Zion Lutheran Church and School in Georgetown, Texas, Principal Reggie, thank you so much for spending some time with us on the Coffee Hour today. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Sarah. It is my pleasure. God's continued blessings. 
You can learn more about Set Apart to Serve by visiting lcms.org slash SAS. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.